Sinchu Valley Community Health Center inaugurates a new label bond built by a Holland philanthropist. The United Nations Development Program, UNDP, says growing violence in Africa is being highly triggered by lack of job opportunities in the continent. And South Sudan Central Bank initiated strong measures to curtail the use of foreign currency in the country. Well, this and more coming your way on the world today. This is Africa TV and you are watching the World Today News Platinum coming to you live from our studios in Banchil. Many thanks for joining us. I am Amadou Kante and now the news in detail. And we begin with health related matters because since Bali Health Centre in Kambano, West Coast region, Wednesday inaugurated its new maternity ward built by Holland Philanthropies as part of efforts to complement government efforts in enhancing health care delivery in the Gambia. The newly built labor board is being widely held by the committee of Sinti Balia, especially the women folks who dominated the new creation ceremony. Maria Macham has the details in this report. The provision of such a health facility for any community have increased their access to crucial primary health care by mitigating concerns such as lack of insurance, long distance traveling and language for their patients and others. Most women in the old union constituency, especially Sinti Bali, usually visit Serekunda General Hospital or Bundung Maternal and Child Health Center for their antenatal and postnatal services. However, with the advent of the newly built maternity ward at the community's health center, the beneficiaries are urged to make best use of the provided anti- and postnatal care. Speaking at the inauguration ceremony, Wuri, a nurse at the Sinchu Bali Health Center, said the community should preserve and also take advantage of the ward, saying it is purposely built for women to stop traveling long distances to seek antenatal care to other health facilities. This labor ward is for the residents of not only Sinchu Bali, but the catchment area villages also are involved. We don't want you to go outside when you can access the health services that you need in this facility. Why go to Fajikula? Why go to Bundung when Sinchubalia can do it? We have the staff, we have the knowledge, and we have the skills. So before you think, I always, during my antenatal, when I am uh, giving the health talks, I said, I usually tell the mothers that, why think Jame Foundation? Why think uh, Fajikula? Think, anytime that you want, uh, services related to your health. Things in Juvalia. Charity begins at home. And we are not far. Looking at the catchment area, all these villages are interconnected. The regional principal nurse Fatou Sanyang encourages pregnant women to be going early for their antenatal to avoid any complications before or during childbirth. <laughs> Alagi Sankare, the director of Health Western Region 1, reiterates the Ministry of Health's desire to make sure every individual has access to quality health care services. He also recognizes the competency of the staff at the health center while advising them to take good care of the maternity ward. I want to inform this August gathering that it is one of our resolve as a Ministry of Health to provide access and quality health care to the population of this country. Initially, our resolve was to ensure that every segment of the population will have access to health care within five kilometer reach. 
But now we have lowered down to three kilometers. Nobody will travel more than three kilometers without having access to healthcare services. And this maternity that we are here gathered to inaugurate is maneuvered by exceptionally highly competent nurses and midwives. And whatever services that any woman will want to have, either in Banjo Lending, Yundam Sukuta, Brufut, Macau, or Serekunda, everybody available in this facility here. Both antenatal services, maternity care, labor and childbirth, outpatient services, and inpatient services. It is a minor health center working alongside with all the health facilities I just mentioned. And as a result, we expect the maternity ward here, that's the labor ward, would not be a white elephant for people to leave this place and then go to other facilities. Through the humanitarian support of the Holland Philanthropist, the community health facility also has an ambulance, borehole, and other needed facilities. The Sinchu Minor Health Center was established in 1982 and it serves as a catchment area of several communities with an estimated population of 78,000 inhabitants. Accordingly, the health facility provides both preventive and curative treatment. With the newly built maternity ward in place, child delivery and maternal health care will be easier for people in the area, especially women. Reporting for iAfrica News, I am Mariama Cham. Now moving on, the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, on Tuesday released its latest finding on the growing violence in Africa entitled Journey to Extremism in Africa. The UNDP report indicates that lack of job opportunity is the leading factor driving people to join the fast-growing violent extremist groups in sub-Saharan Africa. Our reporter Binti Jalo has the details. The report draws from interviews with nearly 2,200 interviewees in eight countries. Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, among others, has shown that Sub-Saharan Africa has become the new global epicenter of violent extremism, with almost half of global terrorism deaths in 2021. More than 1,000 interviewees are former members of violent extremist groups, both voluntary and forced recruits. According to the UNDP report, one quarter of voluntary recruitment opportunities as their main reason for joining violent extremist groups. This is a 92% increase from the last UNDP study on violent extremism in 2017. Speaking during the report launch, the UNDP Administrator Akim Stener outlines the root causes of the increase in violence in Africa. In many countries, where the lack of income, the lack of job opportunities, livelihoods, desperation is essentially pushing people to take up opportunities with whoever offers them to. And the research underscores the relevance of these economic factors as drivers of recruitment. 25% of voluntary recruits cited job opportunities as their primary reason and 40% said they were in urgent need of livelihoods at the time of recruitment. Mr. Stena also observed that the prevailing political tensions in several African countries doesn't come as a surprise. The geopolitical dimension should not surprise anyone. Um, it is a part of precisely this uh, phenomenon when states are essentially no longer able to provide the rule of law and to provide national security, then uh, the opportunity for other actors to become part of this drama grows exponentially. We have seen it in Mali, we've seen it in Libya, um, we've seen it in the Horn of Africa. The main author of the report in UNDP's regional peace building advisor, Nirina Kiplaget, gives an overview of the new report. We find that in the new report that 48% of voluntary recruits do cite a trigger event uh, that caused them to join, and of them, 71% cited these human rights abuses such as government action. The latest report is part of a series of three reports on the prevention of violence extremism, as it highlights the urgent need to move away from security-driven responses to development-based approaches focused on prevention. It also recommends greater investment in basic services, including child welfare, education and calls for an investment in rehabilitation and community-based reintegration services. 
security-driven counter-terrorism responses are often costly, minimally effective. So the UNDP administrator and investment in, in preventive approaches to violent extremism are inadequate. Militant organizations such as ISIC, Boko Haram or Al-Qaeda, who have their origins in a local reality but then become part of the enablers for weapons to be secured and financing across the Sahel, allowing other groups to resource themselves. Based on the interviews, the report also identified factors that pull recruits to disengage such and unmet financial expectations and a lack of trust in the group's leadership as main reasons for leaving. The Sahel has seen the most rapid growth in violent extremist activities of any region in Africa over the past two years. The region is also a link of criminal network and illicit trafficking and has experienced a rise in farm harder violence. Reporting for Africa TV, Binte Yalo. Now let's stay with matters in the African continent because the prevailing car scarcity in Nigeria is affecting business activities in the West African nation especially online monetary uh, transactions. Now, the recent cash shortage began in the country since the introduction of the new banknotes into the market, which uh, with old ones almost fading away. Now, despite the welcoming, uh, of course, the, of the government's move to introduce the new notes, uh, some economic analysts said the impending realities could frustrate citizens to disregard the cashless policy. Let's have more details of that. In this report. The past two weeks have been a roller coaster for Abuja based POS operator Ismaila Abdullahi. Requests for cash withdrawals from his customers have been rising daily. Ismaila cannot get the new Naira notes from the bank, and seeking other options to get cash for payouts means. He has to hike his charges by over 600 percent. Business was quite okay when the cash was available. We used to charge 100 naira for every 10,000 naira payout. But now I charge between 6 to 800 naira for 10,000 naira. I can't even pay one individual up to 20,000 naira. The cash shortage in Nigeria has worsened since the launch of the redesigned notes. While old notes are nearly out of circulation, new ones are in short supply. The ATMs are not dispensing, neither are banks paying over the counter, and other cashless options are mostly inoperative. Now citizens desperate for cash could pay as high as 20% on POS charges. I've seen uh, a friend who paid 200 just to get 1,000, and uh, it's quite high. Little, little transactions like paying for tools, buying water, little, little things that cost maybe 200. You don't have cash in hand to carry out your daily, you know, even daily living at home. You don't have cash because each time you go, they tell you, you know, the ATMs are not working, the POS machines are not working. You try to do a transfer. The bank app itself at times doesn't even respond. According to the World Bank, Nigeria is one of seven countries that contribute to half of the global unbanked population. The low financial inclusion and weak infrastructure are slowing the adoption of the cashless policy. Yes, the policy is a good one. Our old Naira is actually old and it's actually due to be changed, even legally. But there's supposed to be a roadmap. The infrastructure for the cashless policy has not been put in place. Um, if I were to be there, I'm going to ensure that we have steady networks for the bank, for the commercial bank. These challenges are the discouraging, discouraging challenges and it's putting Nigerians off, discouraging them from embracing the cashless policy. Economic watchers urge the government to ramp up the digital platforms to make the transition seamless. And that money-related report uh, is coming from the Nigerian capital, Abuja. Now, elsewhere, the United Nations Refugee Agency High Commissioner Felipe Grandi on Wednesday visited Ethiopia to meet with displaced people in the country and call for more aid and long-term solutions to help those displaced by the recent conflict in the East African nation. Mr. Grandi also made an appeal for further support for the re reconstruction and recovery efforts 
in the face of conflict and climate change. Moses M. Mendy tells us more in this report. The UNHCR chief made these calls while meeting with senior government officials and displaced communities in the Tigray and Amhara regions. Cognizant of the impact of the civil war in Ethiopia, the UN Refugee Agency official highlighted the need for better health, education and sanitation services to enable refugees and host communities to thrive in line with the Global Compact on Refugees. In his deliberation, Mr. Grandi noted that progress is visible on the ground, adding that the displacement site will be more accessible now. The peace agreement that was signed in Pretoria and the Nairobi declaration that followed a few months ago have improved the situation considerably. So all this work that has been very difficult during the hostilities is going to be more uh, uh, accessible now. According to the UN High Commissioner, people are now getting assistance and some have started to go back to their homes. But more needs to be done to support the reconstruction and recovery efforts in some of the affected areas, including the Tigray region. He further outlines that it will be critical to improve their living conditions and work towards lasting solutions, including voluntary returns to their communities. The peace deal signed by the federal government and opposition forces in northern Ethiopia in November has enabled UNHCR and other partners to step up the delivery of the much-needed aid, including medicines, shelter, materials, clothes, household items, and blankets. According to the UN Office for the Coordination and Humanitarian Affairs OCHA latest report, food deliveries had reached more than 3.8 million people in the Tigray region from mid-November to January. 4.2 million Ethiopians are said to be internally displaced, largely resulting from the conflict and tensions. Even so, the country hosts more than 800,000 refugees and asylum seekers, mainly from South Sudan, Somalia and Eritrea. As the situation evolves, the UNHCR chief reaffirms his commitment to support the humanitarian response for refugees and internally displaced people in Ethiopia and work towards achieving long-term solutions including for those displaced by drought and the impact of climate change. The Commissioner called on the international community to also increase their financial commitment to support refugees in Ethiopia, where he says efforts are currently underfunded. For iAfrica News, I am Moses Imende. And you are watching the World Today News Bulletin on Africa TV coming to you live from our studios in Banjul. And from the report there by Moses Imendi, we now take a break and come back shortly. Tough Africa Global brings you state of the art commercial and retail spaces available for rent at Madiba Mall, located at the Proofwood Gardens Estate. Our commercial spaces comes with facilities such as 24 hour security, standby backup generator, air conditioning, shared conference room, and personal cash pool meters. If you are looking for a spacious and suitable business environment, look no further. Madiba Mall retail and commercial spaces are just what you need. Ocean View office spaces with limited availability. Call us today and secure a space. For more information, contact 733-3363 or 594-1053 or email at info at topafricaglobal.com. Welcome back. This is Africa TV, and you are watching the World Today News Bulletin. And once again, many thanks for joining us, and let's now look at the rest of the stories. Now, the United Nations Regional Humanitarian Coordinator in Syria has said that Monday's earthquake is the last thing Syrians wanted, owing that the country is struggling with years of humanitarian support now, rescue workers continue searching for survivors buried in the rubble of thousands of buildings destroyed in Turkey and Syria by catastrophic earthquakes and aftermaths of the Soxrada that killed more than 12,000 people. Now, just like in Turkey, 
damaged roads and bad weather conditions are also frustrating rescue operations in Syria. Let's have more details of that in this report by Maria Macham. With mountain challenges affecting the country, the regional humanitarian coordinator for Syria crisis, Mohanan Hadi, said the earthquake that affected at least 10 million people is the last thing the Syrian people needed. Speaking to journalists in New York on Wednesday, he said the country finds itself in a difficult situation by trying to reach to others. This is the last thing the Syrian people, the Syrian people needed. And we were struggling for years and years to meet their humanitarian needs, even without this latest, this last catastrophe. But, you know, we find ourselves now in a very difficult position, uh, fighting with time, trying to reach people uh, all over Syria. The regional humanitarian coordinator also informed that the road leading from Gaziantep to the transshipment point border, which had been damaged and couldn't be used to send relief items, should be opening soon. The coordinator also informed that there is hope to access the border as they are discussing with their Turkish counterparts to also give them all the support. We see ourselves, uh, you know, our, our, our objective is to reach the people. For us, cross-border and cross-line are just modalities complementing each other. The most important thing that we reach people in this desperate, in this, in this time, people who are desperate for, uh, for help in this, in this very difficult situation. We're seeing images on TV, children uh, stranded uh, in very harsh, uh, cold winter, snowing. Uh, it's, it's really, it's really heart, heartbreaking. Speaking from Damascus in Syria, El Mustafa Ben Lamli, resident coordinator and humanitarian coordinator in Trim for Syria, also reiterates the hard situation the earthquake had put on Syrians. And all of a sudden comes this, and all the achievements we had before, anybody who had that small business now has lost that small business. Anybody who could go to school cannot go to school. Women who could go to protection centers cannot go to protection centers. So it's a terrible situation where even the 15.3 million people that were in need here in Syria, now we have to revise that number. Amit calls for Turkey's government to send more help to the disaster zone. Turkey now has tens of thousands of aid personnel in the quake zone, and such teams from more than two dozen countries have joined them. But with the devastation so widespread, Many are still waiting for help and hope of rescuing survivors is fading. Experts said the survival window for those trapped under the rubble of collapsed buildings or otherwise unable to access water, food protection from the elements, or medical attention was closing rapidly. At the same time, they said it was too soon to abandon hope for more rescues. Reporting for iAfrica News, I am Maria Macha. Rescue operations continued both in Turkey and Syria following the Monday's deadly earthquake that struck the two countries. Now, finally, South Sudan's central bank has outlined stringent measures to limit the use of foreign currency in local services in the country, saying that all the transactions in this African country should now be turned with the local currency. Now, the latest move by the South Sudanese government did not go down well with some businesses in the country, as many claim it could affect their business activities. However, the government says the decision is meant to address the country's economic crisis. Here's more details of that in the report. Hotels, services in restaurants and rent payments are often made using the US dollar in South Sudan. However, the country's central bank says that is destroying the economy. There is a clear directives from the central bank that all the transactions in South Sudan must be done in our currency. So all that all those contracts which are being signed must be signed in our local currency. The government says the move is one of the measures recommended by a committee appointed by President Salva Kiir to address the country's economic crisis. But those involved in travel and tour businesses say the move will have negative effects. We as South Sudanese, we don't have our specific airlines, we don't have. We are hiring it. And for us to hire it, we have to change it. When we brought the money into local currency, we have to change the dollar. And to change is that well, definitely we are not going to do anything. Because when things work up in local currency, 
it is good for other businesses, but for us airport, it is not good. These banks that are here, EQT and KCB, and they are in Kenya, when you go with your pounds here, you won't give to them, they won't take, they say, no, don't take this currency. So if the Minister of Finance can make these two countries recognize pounds, and people move with pounds in their pockets, it will be very easy. Many goods in South Sudan, including agricultural produce, are imported from neighboring countries, which requires the U.S. dollar. Business people here say the chain could limit their ability to import goods because it restricts access to hard currency, something which is already in short supply in the country. One expert says the government will have to do more for the directive to be accepted by businesses. Obviously, the issue of the contracts being in dollars was due to the inflation, where people were not able to predict the, 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 the rates. But the government is counting on more transactions in South Sudan's pounds to help stabilize the economy. You've been watching the World Today News Bulletin on Africa TV coming to you live from our studios in Banjul. And from the report from South Sudan, we now eventually bring this news edition to an end. But for more details on this and other stories, as always, as ever, you can visit on our website on africa.tv. But for now, many thanks for the pleasure of your company. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and do have a pleasant evening. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.